Hello, I'm Barry Daniel and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated ethical life, avoiding dogma or any absolute appeal to authority. Today's guest is the British environmental writer and political activist George Monbiot. George writes a weekly column for The Guardian and is the author of a number of books including Captive State, The Corporate Takeover of Britain and Feral, Searching for Enchantment on the Frontiers of Rewilding. He will be discussing the topic of rewilding with the chair of the Middleway Society, the philosopher Robert M. Ellis. Okay, welcome back to the Middle Way Society podcast, George and Robert. Thanks very much, Barry. Thanks, Robert. Well, perhaps to begin, George, you could begin by telling us a bit about your background and how how that prompted you to write the book. Well, my background is quite posh. I came from the third tier, um, the third sort of dominant tier of British society um, without land or capital, but my father had a sufficient income to send me to a private school, um, which I hated with a passion. (laughs) Um, I was boarding from the age of eight. It was a terrible place, abusive in lots of different ways. Um, And really, you know, as I began to piece it all together later on, um, gave me an insight into how the world is treated. You know, if the dominant classes represented by that school treat their own children as badly as we were treated then how about other people's children how about other people how about other nations and that was part of what set me off on my journey to try to find out how the world works a journey which has involved as much unlearning as it's involved learning Mm -hmm. uh, which has required that I jettison just about everything I was brought up to believe about the world and try to learn afresh. And the unlearning takes as much time and energy and effort as the learning, possibly even more. That's something I very much value in your work, George, what I've, I've read, that that's this um, emphasis, I suppose, on yeah, learning afresh, but you're constantly challenging us to see a bigger picture, usually, it seems to me. Uh, mm. Certainly, I felt that from from reading Feral and from many of your um, Guardian pieces, there's some I, sort of I, I, limiting I, assumption we, we have to get yeah. beyond. Yeah. I mean, I should emphasise the positive side of this as well. I mean, it, it, mm. it didn't all come out of misery. It also came out of curiosity. Yeah, and, and I find the world totally fascinating. And it's partly fascinating because it's so different to the world I was brought up to see. Mm. And, and it's so much richer and people have so much more potential and variety and interest than the very stereotyped way in which we were brought up to see people in this very sort of class-bound and narrow and prejudiced way. And it turns out that ecosystems are so much more interesting and behave in ways that weren't anticipated as we start to discover when they're allowed to recover that they don't behave at all as we thought they behaved that much of what we were studying was an artifact of human intervention so you know part of what motivates me is yes the unlearning the escaping from these profoundly negative and bleak ways of seeing the world with which i was brought up but also what motivates me is a totally fascinating wealth of knowledge that there is to be gained and I have this almost this sense of desperation there's so little time and there's so much to learn and I know Mm. that I'll only ever learn a a handful of the grains of sand on this vast beach but I know that every single one of them is fascinating I feel greedy for knowledge. That's great yeah I mean in terms of, of the ways we limit ourselves ways we get stuck in particular ways of assuming that's my particular area of interest i think and and have you have you come across or explored psychological or neuroscientific accounts of why we limit ourselves in the ways that you know obviously affect the issues you're writing about well i i can't claim to be able to speak authoritatively on on those areas um 
But I do know from my own experience that it's overcoming the self-limitation, the sense of what the boundaries of your own self and knowledge are, the boundaries of what you might be able to do, the boundaries of, of who you are in relation to others, that has been at the centre of my quest for enlightenment. And that it's that sort of discovery of what my own nature is, but more generally what human nature is, and finding out that human nature is completely different to what I was led to believe, what almost all of us are led to believe. You know, we have this pervasive sense that humans are fundamentally selfish and greedy. That's um, there in the notion of original sin, it's there in Aristotle, it's there in Hobbes, um, and it's there above all in neoliberalism, mm. which says humans are selfish and greedy, and this is a good thing because we should recruit this selfishness and greed because that drives the invisible hand which godlike delivers all the good things that we want in life. And it turns out that this is a completely unscientific view of humanity, that where I have been reading quite a lot in neuroscience, in social psychology, in anthropology, in evolutionary biology, because I've, I've become almost desperate to know what human beings are really like, how we really work, how we really think. And it turns out there's a huge body of research um, and a very interesting experimental evidence to determine exactly this. And it turns out that the great majority of us do have selfishness and greed in us, but they're not our dominant values. They're in there, but they're not at the top of the scale of our values. And at the top are values such as altruism, empathy, community feeling, family feeling, um, a wish to do well to others. It's very interesting. You talk to people and you say, what do you like? And they say, well, you know, I sort of I want to rub along with people. Oh, obviously, I want a good life, but, you know, I don't want to harm anybody else. Um, you know, I want to have a good community. I want to have a nice family life. You know, these are my aspirations. Uh, this is how I live. What do you do? Well, you know, um, there's um, an old lady around the corner and I um, help her out from time to time. And, uh, you know, you look at the way people behave, um, you know, help someone get onto a train and carry their bags for them all these things and then you say okay that's what you're like what are other people like oh terrible oh it's awful you know they're so selfish and greedy and just always jostling and stuff and and you find that we have this completely mistaken conception of humanity because actually most other people are like us they have those same values unfortunately we tend to be dominated by people who don't Broadly speaking, we're a society of altruists governed by psychopaths. There is this small number of people who don't have that dominant value set, for whom selfishness and greed are the dominant values. And in fact, you know, neoliberalism is really describing itself. It's describing its leading lights who seem to have a very different set of values to the rest of society and to extrapolate from their own values to assume that this is how people are. Um, but we're not. We're absolutely not. So that's been, for me, a fascinating journey. And, and the exciting conclusion from that journey is we don't have to change human nature. We just have to reveal it. But wouldn't you say that we all have our own psychopath, inner psychopath in a way, to some extent? I mean, have you come across brain lateralization, the left and right hemispheres and their, their different functions? So the evidence of people like Ian McGilchrist, for example, that, mm -hmm. that's the... Yes. Our left hemisphere, particularly prefrontal lobe, has a tendency to construct things a particular way and get attached to those particular ways of thinking, which then prevent us from thinking more widely in all sorts of ways. Well, of course, that's true, but that doesn't turn us into psychopaths. Mm. It can narrow and limit our perceptions and limit our options, limit our, our, our self-conception. It can push us in directions that if someone asked us, if someone sort of said, okay, why did you do that? We'd be really hard put to explain. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, one of our primary human tasks is to overcome those limitations and to discover the wealth of our humanity, which is a very great wealth indeed. You know, we are fundamentally good natured, but we behave in bad ways because we get blinkered. We find ourselves running down narrow corridors towards a goal that has been set for us, which, 
you know, had we stood back and made an objective choice, we never would have set for ourselves. Mm -hmm. you know, why is it so important to have that pair of shoes? Why do we want that fancy car? Why do we need an upgrade to our phone every year? You know, yeah. th these are these are limitations which have been created by our social environment, which of course interacts with the peculiar ways in which the brain functions. Yeah. Um, and so it's recognizing those limitations and overcoming them is, is an absolutely crucial attribute of being human. And it should be one of our foremost human goals. Yes, I mean, obviously that standing back and becoming more aware of the situation. I mean, you, you could obviously link that with awareness of the body and of, of, uh, through the right hemisphere, awareness of different ways of constructing things with different metaphors and, and so on. Um, I mean, I've been, I was very interested reading your your book recently and seeing how that kind of, well, I suppose that polarisation emerges in the, the field of what you broadly call conservation or the, uh, the issue of how we use the, the land. I mean, would you agree that's an example? I mean, for example, the unthinkability of rewilding, you know, as, as a, a goal beyond just conservation, however conservation is construed. Do you feel people have a kind of often a fixed, narrow understanding of that? Well, I, I went through this process myself um, while I was writing the book because I, I kind of stumbled into um, feral this, this, uh, and, and into rewilding um, in that I was utterly horrified by the surroundings um, of where I lived when I lived in mid Wales um, and just how this place, which was meant to be wild and free from um, human construction, was actually even more lifeless than the city from which I'd come. Mm. Um, and, and, and as I began to wonder about this and to explore the implications, that was the point at which I stumbled across the concept of rewilding and suddenly it all began to fall into place. But doing so involved challenging my deep preconceptions and prejudices about what a desirable state of, of the natural world might be and a desirable interaction between humans and the natural world might be. And uh, among the places I traveled to was um, this uh, rewilding site in Scotland, Dundregan, run by Trees for Life and the extraordinary, inspiring Alan Watson Featherstone, who, who founded the organization. And, and he started talking when we were up there about the possibility of rewilding the wolf, bringing back wolves to Britain. And it was simultaneously the most thrilling and disturbing thought I'd had in years. <laughs> Could we really do this? It just felt so transgressive, even to imagine it. Yeah. Now, as of the last year or so, there are several wolves running around in the Netherlands, a far tamer yeah. landscape than Britain. If you look at Britain in aggregate, you know, with all our uplands where hardly anybody lives, far more densely habited than Britain. Um, and it's just commonplace. It's no, no one panics. There's um, uh, no stampedes down the street. It's just wolves are part of the living world there now, uh, as they were before. They've come back and people broadly seem to be happy about it. But the idea that we might bring them back to Britain has been presented to us as such a horrifying notion that even to have it feels like a trespass. And, and I had that strong sense of transgression and trespass when Alan first started talking about it. And then as I started thinking about it, I thought, well, why? Why am I finding this so hard to process? And that was the point at which I started examining in greater depth my conceptions of what a desirable ecosystem might be. So did that involve re-examining what was meant by conservation or what kind of priority it had as an idea? Well, yes, I, I became from then on highly critical of the British model of conservation, which is basically about clinging on to what we have, however pathetic the tiny remaining scraps of nature may be. Um, this sort of tiny um, remnant of what was once a thriving ecosystem, rather than trying to create 
or protect ecosystems we don't yet have. Being ambitious about what we want British ecosystems to be and being prepared to have controversial discussions and difficult debates with people and to be inspiring, to be exciting, to call for the return of rich and thriving and vibrant ecosystems with large animals in them. Yeah. We expect people in Africa and India um, to live with um, lions and elephants and tigers and we get very upset if if they don't want to live with them and they want to kill them. And we don't seem prepared to live with pine martins in this country. <laughs> it's pathetic. And it's only very recently that any major conservation group has even been prepared to mention the idea of bringing pine martins back to places where they've become extinct because it was too controversial. Yeah, I mean, you talk about shifting baseline syndrome, which I think was a really, really helpful term. It was a way in which people have, um, well, for some reason, seem to prefer an idea of the landscape 100 years ago rather than 2000 years ago as, as a basis of you know, judging how it ought to be. It's a um, form of social forgetting. Mm. The term was coined by the fisheries biologist Daniel Pawley. Um, and it's very useful. It's a very useful term for understanding our shifting perceptions. Um, so uh, what it means is that we conceive as natural and normal the circumstances that prevailed in our own youth. So we see ecosystems that prevailed in our own youth as being the right baseline to which to return, unaware that they themselves were highly depleted and that previous generations would have recognized them as being a state of destruction. Mm. And with each generation, our perceptions shift until um, we become further and further away from an understanding of what a functioning ecosystem is and could be. And I find this a very useful way of looking at the world in general. We have a political shifting baseline syndrome as well, where we become used to more and more absurd political situations. Um, and we want to return to just a slightly less absurd political situation, because that's the one we were <laughs> accustomed to in our youth, rather than taking the long view and saying, how about something completely different? Yeah. I mean, coming back to the, to the top predators, issue as well that you mentioned in relation to rewilding. I mean, do you think people's uh, objections to, to having wolves back, for example, is that connected, do you think, to common misjudgments about risk? Mm. Yes, we are really, really bad at assessing risk. Yeah, a classic example is we are super alert to the risk of terrorism, but the chances of dying through terrorism are really tiny. We're much less alert to the risk of air pollution, but the chances of dying through air pollution are really very high now, higher than almost any other cause on Earth now of, of meeting an early death. Um, air pollution comes out more or less on top. And yet we, uh, there was a survey just recently showing that most people were completely unaware of it. Completely unaware of it. But everyone's aware of terrorism. And we are super attuned to the possible risk from wild animals even though it's minuscule by comparison to other risks we might face. So in North America, for example, the risk of wolf attacks, there have been one or two, but it's absolutely infinitesimal. It's far smaller than the risk of being killed by a vending machine. <laughs> um, every year in, in North America, at least one person is killed by a vending machine, partly because they shake them to try to get the money out, and these things <laughs> fall on top of them. You know, a vending machine could pounce on you at any time. Uh, but, um, you know, there are sort of 50 year intervals between people being killed by wolves, anyone being killed by a wolf. You're far more likely to die from a toothpick than you are from a wolf. One of the biggest killers is bedroom slippers. Because um, people have bedroom sli slippers without backs on them. And as they go up the stairs, the slippers slip off and they fall down the stairs and they die. You know, but but you know, no one's terrified of bedroom slippers. We don't have children's stories about the bedroom slipper, which could be about to to kill you. But the big bad wolf is everywhere, except yeah. actually, you know, it's nowhere in terms of actual risks that we face. So so we have an urgent need, I think, to um, 
get a much better appreciation of the risks that we face in the 21st century and an appreciation of the things which are so small. They are risks, but they're so small that they needn't impinge on our consciousness at all. So do you think if we actually have more of the top predators back, uh, at least in this safe British Isles, um, would that help us psychologically, perhaps, do you think, so to have real top predators as opposed to imaginary ones or substitutes? I think there is something we are missing. And the term which I came up with to try to describe this was ecological boredom. Um, I, I believe that we all possess what I call a ghost psyche, vestigial psychological equipment that existed to help us navigate a world of horns and tusks and fangs and claws that we no longer face. And some of this we are aware of, um, you know, and it's and, and it's released when we play computer games, shooting each other up and the rest of it. But some of it, I believe, we very seldom encounter. And only a couple of times in my life have I really felt it. It's like opening a gate of perception in my brain. And and boy, it's a most incredible sensation. It's like the best drug that I'm sure you've never taken. And one of them, interestingly, both instances were very similar because they, they seemed to sort of tap into a hunter-gatherer past. One of them was where I was uh, walking through a wood on a foraging expedition, not doing very well, and came across a muntjac, a little deer which had just died it was still warm it says eyes were still bright but it had just dropped dead and i don't know why it had dropped dead so i did something very foolish i thought um oh i'm on a foraging expedition so um uh, here's a deer i'll, for I'll forage it that's fantastic isn't that it was perfect uh, now you know you shouldn't pick up an animal which has just died because that is a real risk you know it might have died of anthrax or something you have no idea why it just dropped down dead so you, you could introduce yourself to some really nasty germs. But anyway, I, I, you know, I, the, the hind brain had kicked in. So I picked this thing up. It's just a small deer and slung it over my shoulders. And it was the most extraordinary sensation when I did so. I felt the warmth of it on my shoulders. And it was like I swelled in size. I doubled in size. And I just wanted to roar. And I felt this incredible, feral excitement fill my whole body quite a remarkable thing it's like this sort of terrifying but also just wonderful mm. it felt incredible i wanted to stomp around and dance with this thing on my back i mean this was a really primal urge the other occasion was when um i had this crazy idea to try to spear flounders in the estuary where I lived in, in mid Wales. And uh, it was a sort of stupid idea, really, and, and it was completely unsuccessful, I'm kind of glad to say. But I'd, I'd brought back this um, fish spear, the head of a spear from um, Brazil when I'd worked there many years ago, and I managed to find it and lashed it to a, um, a, a long hazel pole. And, and with a friend, we, we went wading in this estuary for a whole day trying to find some flounders to spear, which we, we didn't succeed. But while I was doing so, walking up through the, the water, the shallow water, and watching and watching, I found my senses becoming ever more attuned. It was a quite remarkable sensation where I became sharper and sharper and sharper until it was like I wasn't just seeing the sandy bed beneath the ripples it felt like I was seeing so much more. I was just seeing a whole world there, which I hadn't really seen in the same light before. It just, it was like an opening up. And I suddenly reached this point where it felt as if I was no longer a human, like I'd become a heron or something. It was quite amazing. Again, it's incredibly rich sensation, which completely flooded my brain, where I seemed to pass through some kind of portal into a different state of perception and a different state of consciousness and being. And it was overwhelming, the, the force of this feeling. Now, the amazing thing was that sometime afterwards, um, you know, months later, I was discussing it with the guy that I'd been doing this with, uh, my friend Johnny, who had rigged up a spear of his own. And, and I, I said, look, I didn't, 
I'll tell you about this at the time, but you know, I had this incredible feeling. This thing happened to me. And he said, but that's amazing. Exactly the same thing happened to me. And I didn't tell you about it either. So there was something, again, that we both tapped into. There was something which was in there, but we didn't know about, that we hadn't found in our brains before. And I suspect that during our hunter-gatherer past, we would have been aware of those parts of our mind almost all the time. We would have, again and again and again, we would have tapped into that. And we would have had these incredibly rich psychic experiences as a result. I mean, would you recommend that for more people? Or do you think that's an ex kind of experience that's very specific to your personality? I don't know. I mean, the fact that Johnny had exactly the same experience in exactly the same circumstances suggests that this might be replicable. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Mm. It is. There, there's... You know, maybe there are ways of tapping back into it. I've had similar feelings, not quite the same, in my unexpected encounters with megafauna. Like when a huge bull dolphin leapt over my kayak in Cardigan Bay, went right over my head. Um, or when I came round a forest path in the Bielowiecia Forest in Poland and came face to face with a bison so close I could almost touch it. And these were some thrilling and slightly scary experiences, especially the bison. But at the same time, there was something of that extraordinary wealth of feeling that, that came over me at the time. Mm -hmm. And just the thing about wolves, to, to come back to them, is that you very seldom see one. You know, even if there are quite a few wolves living in your area, you very seldom see one. But knowing they're there, mm -hmm. that's the exciting thing. And that enriches our inner lives. Okay. Are we perhaps panning out a bit to the view of the whole ecosystem that appears in your book, which I also found inspiring? I mean, how far do you think humans actually could have a stable role in the wider ecosystem? Is it, is it just a matter of minimising the damage we do? Or is it, would it be possible for us to actually develop a stable position in it? Well, I, I want to, I mean, I see rewilding as not a human withdrawal from nature, but a re-engagement with nature, yeah. though on different, on a different basis. Mm -hmm. And first of all, a recognition of the extraordinary way in which ecosystems behave, drawing on this wonderful pool of new knowledge that we've recently been developing and understanding trophic cascades for example the the way in which large predators and large herbivores can affect the entire ecosystem all the way down even potentially affecting non-biological factors such as soil fertility and um, erosion rates and the movement of rivers um, and the carbon in the atmosphere and so much else besides. Um, you begin to see that there's definitely something to be said at the ecological level for Gaia theory, that to a much greater extent than we thought, ecosystems affect the world around them and particular species within those ecosystems can have profound effects. And so that knowledge equips us to engage in the world on a new basis, to find wonders which we hadn't seen before and to place ourselves within it, no longer as exploiters, no longer as controllers, no longer as stewards or owners of the world, but as one species among millions navigating its own existence among the existence of millions. And to see ourselves not so much in fatal competition with the rest of the world, but to try to achieve a cooperation with it. I'm beginning to believe that most animals would initially have been tame as far as human beings were concerned. And the fact that wild animals are so frightened of us and run away from us and that we get so few glimpses of them is a result of many hundreds of thousands of years of persecution particularly 
by modern anatomically modern humans using more sophisticated weapons but in places where that persecution has stopped what you find is that very rapidly the wildlife becomes tame again mm. and will come very close to you will will um, and begin to look for ways of cooperation it's not at all difficult to see how animals were domesticated and it wouldn't all have been by force um, and I'm not talking obviously about domestication I'm talking in this case about new ways of living alongside wildlife where we don't fear each other but we respect each other and we are fascinated by each other and and you know in my in my experience in places where wildlife has once more become friendly towards people, you know, will approach you, I get a strong feeling of just that. Mm -hmm. That just reminds me of an experience I had a few years ago in the Galapagos. I, I didn't have quite the same feeling of that sense of feral um, engagement with it, but it was a, it was more a sense of wonder. Did you? Yeah. I mean, I've had a, a similar experience actually with a with a deer, given that I was in a, at that time in a very meditative, calm state of mind, coming right up to a deer and, and being able to engage with it in a way you know, we'd normally be able to do. Um, so I can appreciate that that's, you know, that's, it's possible in some ways for us to change our immediate relationship with, with the world around us. I just wonder you know, whether there's some limits on that, given that, given that we do have these manipulative gold-driven left prefrontal cortex is and yeah, we we do tend to want to organize things our own way don't we have to take account of that in some ways uh, that that has to in some ways balance with, with our adjustments to the world well i mean if we're going to live in cooperation with the rest of the living world we have to reorganize ourselves mm. substantially we can no longer accept an oligarchic society where a few phenomenally rich people hoover up so much of the world's wealth and then translate their economic power into political power and drive us towards ruin. There's um, a very interesting um, thesis by, what's his name, Kenneth Mackay? I think it's Kenneth Mackay. He's a Canadian professor who says, you know, when you look at the history of collapse, what you see is that it's not so much complexity which is driving it it's not so much the inevitable disappearance of of resources and the inability of resources to to support us it's more that an oligarchic class drives us towards that ruin yeah yeah it's kevin mckay um this is his thesis and he says that um you know what history shows is that where you are dominated by oligarchies those oligarchies have short-term interests which are radically different to the long-term interests of society. And they will, in pursuing those interests and basically forcing everybody else to fall in line with those interests, drive their societies over the brink and into ruin. And that when you look at collapsed societies around the world, they all have that characteristic. Now, unfortunately, we have that characteristic that we have an oligarchic class of multi-billionaires with their capital offshore with much of their wealth coming from rent economic rent which they're extracting from other people who are pouring billions of dollars into think tanks and other lobby groups who are trying to prevent us from taking act action to prevent climate breakdown who are trying to destroy our social systems and our public services and the rest of it just so that they can enrich themselves further and release themselves from the constraints of democracy. They don't want to be regulated, they don't want to pay tax and the rest of it. And it is them, this small group of people who are driving us towards ruin and because we are a society of altruists governed by psychopaths and because we're used to being that, we're allowing them to do that. Though they are such a tiny minority. And then we say, oh, aren't human beings awful? Look at what we're doing. So, no, we're not doing this. This tiny group of people is driving us this way. And it's limiting our perceptions. You know, we're allowing our perception of the problem to be limited and therefore our perception of the solutions to be limited. Yeah, well, that's obviously the connection between your writings are quite broadly about social justice and political justice and sustainability. 
The, the last question, uh, George, what is your understanding of the middle way and how might that relate to what you've been talking about today? I strongly feel that we have a duty as human beings to find balance within ourselves and between each other. I mean, I, I see our primary goals, uh, the goals we should have, to seek to give love and receive love, to seek enlightenment, either spiritual or intellectual or both, to learn and to teach, uh, to create and to invest our inner worlds with meaning and purpose while spreading kindness towards others. The, 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 these are the, the fundamentals for me of what life should be. I mean, after the weirdness of my childhood and a sort of psychic collapse at university when it all just became impossible for me to sustain my worldview, I set out from that point onwards to try to work out what a good life looked like. And I'm still trying to work it out. Mm. And I think that some of what you've been talking about with your middle way, that is a component of working out what that good life should be. Thank you. And a final comment, Robert? Yeah, thank you very much for that, George. I think there's, there's a lot of common ground in, in what we're trying to do in the middle way society and, and I think in your work. So. It's been a great privilege to talk to you. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks very much, guys. Very nice to, to talk to you. Take care. Bye, Bye now. Bye-bye. You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.